Today's You Asked is dedicated to answering one question. Why don't we buy the TVs that we review? Welcome back everyone, I'm Caleb Dennison and this is You Asked, a series in which I answer frequently asked questions to help you live your best tech life and also to connect with all of you who so graciously watch and support this channel. So sometimes that means going behind the scenes, talking shop, or sharing personal anecdotes. It's my go at providing infotainment. This week, I'm excited to answer one of the most frequently asked questions I've gotten over the 13 years or so that I've been reviewing tech. And I'll tackle that in a moment. But before I do, I wanted to say thank you encourage you to show your appreciation by clicking some buttons of support and remind you that while you can always leave questions in the comments section of any of our videos, I would encourage you to also email your questions and comments to you asked at digitaltrends.com because frankly, it's easier to find and manage emails than it is to pour over the comment section. Okay, here we go. I hope you don't mind that I'm not singling out any one viewer's question for answering this question. It's just the most frequently asked question I get, so I figured I would answer it for everyone. That question usually goes something like, why don't you buy the TVs you review instead of accepting review samples from TV brands? And then there's usually a list of proposed advantages to buying the TVs that we review at retail, like avoiding golden samples, getting a better feel for what the average customer deals with, etc. So the reasons we don't buy the TVs that we review, or for that matter, most of the products that we review are multitudinous. I really wanted to say multitudinous. Anyway, there are so many, in fact, that I had to create an outline so I could present them in some kind of coherent manner. I've done the best I can in that regard, and to that end, I can break things down into a few categories. One, logistics. Two, cost and time three, liability, four, access, and five, miscellaneous matters of feasibility. I'm especially fond of that last one. You ready? Cause it's a lot, but remember you asked. <laughs> okay, here we go. And as we do, we'll just pretend that each category stands on its own, but by the end of this little diatribe, I think you'll see how they're really all interconnected. We'll start with logistics. And under logistics, we have actual logistics. That's the shipping and receiving involved. Then there's storage and we'll wrap up with insurance. We'll start with storage. We have limited space to store TVs. Realistically, this new studio space can handle at most three TVs and their boxes at a time. I mean, just take a look at where we're at right now, okay? I've got the LG M3 OLED. Uh, that 77 inch TV is on the BDI Elements cabinet now and the box for that TV is taking up most of the space along the garage door access which means physically getting more TVs in here is now harder. Then we have the 85 inch Sony X95L that just came in, finally, and it isn't even out of its box. It's just taking up a massive amount of space next to our actual storage shelves. And then there's the TCL Q7 on deck. That TV is taking up all the space on our BDI Octave console while its box is hanging out on top of the storage shelving. Now, while I can put some empty boxes up there, I can't put boxes with TVs in them up on those shelves. We tried and well, it's not smart or safe. We'll just leave it at that. So you may be wondering, well, Caleb, why don't you just get a storage unit if storage is an issue? To which I'd say, oh, I have one. I'll get to that in the time cost section. Then there's the shipping part. Eventually these TVs need to get shipped out. Who am I gonna ship them to? Well, options could include a buyer or an auction winner or possibly a charity or contest winner. Who's gonna handle that shipment process? I'll get to that in the time cost section as well. But in addition to the challenges associated with shipping TVs out of here, there's the matter of insurance. I'm gonna need to ensure that the TV arrives to its destination safely, on time, and in good condition. That means contracting with a logistics company that is not FedEx or UPS, and it means adding insurance. All of that, as you gathered, leads us into time and cost. And under that time and cost category, we have the time dedicated to logistics and the cost of the logistics, as well as the cost of purchasing the TVs and the cost associated with taking a loss for each and every TV that we review. Let's start with the time associated with the logistics. We review enough TVs here that we would need a person dedicated just to handling the shipping and receiving of TVs. That means being on the phone with the logistics companies, constantly coordinating the delivery of the TVs, booking the shipping of outbound TVs and coordinating the pickup as well as shuttling TVs back and forth to the storage unit 
all while carefully timing things such that only the TVs we absolutely must have at the studio are actually in the studio. This would necessarily mean that a TV I don't actually want to be here would have to be here taking up the space of another TV that I actually wanted here, even with the careful timing of our dedicated logistics person. That person would also have to handle all of the processes involved in listing and selling the TV, collecting payments, running an auction and collecting payments or finding a charity or running a giveaway. All of that is a full-time job and that costs a not insignificant amount of money, which moves us to costs. We're gonna have to eat a loss on every TV we sell. Even if I had time to professionally calibrate each TV as a value add on the sale to help minimize loss, that's not legal for me to do. And I don't have the time to do that. In addition to eating the loss on the cost of the TV, and that assumes that we sell it as opposed to give it away, we have to support the cost of shipping every outbound TV, which is no small amount because we're talking about shipping a lot of large, heavy objects around. Plus we have to pay for the insurance to make sure that if it doesn't arrive in good shape, the cost of the TV is covered and can be replaced. Also, there's time involved in replacing the TV and there's costs associated with shuttling the TVs around locally to and from our storage unit. I mean, conservatively, we're looking at no less than $85,000 a year, conservatively. Never mind all the headaches that will arise when something goes wrong. Also, there's time consideration in that as the seller of the TV, there's inherently this expectation that we're gonna have to somehow support the sale or help troubleshoot. We aren't Best Buy or Value Electronics. We cannot offer that service. Now, to all of you who might say, well, ratings and consumer reports does it. Well, we aren't ratings or consumer reports. We have a completely different business model. And I might point out that business models like ratings and consumer reports are very much in the minority. And there's a good reason for that. But beyond the business model considerations, this job of pulling in many, many TVs per year and then making them disappear it's only feasible for us when all the logistics and costs are handled by the TV brands. They have it built into their budgets. That's why review samples are a thing and why the vast majority of publications participate in reviewer programs. Oh, and one more cost I forgot to mention, insurance for us. Our studio and storage unit are covered up to a certain amount. The more TVs we have sitting around, the more risk we take on if there is theft, fire, or some other cataclysmic event. If something bad were to happen, we'd take a huge hit. The next category I put down is liability, but I kind of already covered some of this in terms of the liability involved in making sure a TV arrives in good shape, the expectation that we service a sale like a retailer, and the liability of loss due to a tragic event. But there's also liability involved with Uncle Sam. Hell yeah. We are not an authorized retailer or reseller of consumer electronics. Once we pass a certain threshold, we are treading into legal hot water. Now we have a lawyer on staff at Digital Trends, but this kind of thing is not in their purview and quite frankly, it can't be. All of that is reason enough that we can't buy our TVs at retail, but there are some access considerations as well. By access, I mean a few different things. First and possibly foremost is that I can often get products sooner than they're available at retail. That changed for a little bit during the pandemic when logistics became a nightmare for everyone, but it's been returning to normal. So obviously I'm interested in getting products as soon as I can to provide timely reviews. But also by developing open dialogue with TV brands, getting briefings so I can understand their technology better, et cetera. Oh, and being able to provide those brands with feedback on their products. There are multiple benefits. One, I can get answers to deep technical questions pretty quickly. I have access to the engineers who designed this stuff. I have access to the manufacturing facilities that put it together. I can get information a lot of other folks just can't. Two, I can also provide feedback to these companies that make their products better by the time that they do reach store shelves. This is a big part of why firmware updates come quickly and fix problems before or soon after TVs land in people's homes. Oh, and I almost forgot, we're seeing an increasing number of TVs that won't get shipped to any reviewers. In those cases, TV brands will host reviewer workshops where I and other journalists can get some one-on-one -on -one time with the TVs that are just too big or too expensive to ship. 
In some cases, that's the only way we'd be able to review them at all, unless we bought them and waited for them to arrive. But that takes us back to the points I made earlier, only the stakes are way, way higher with a $30,000 TV than they are with a $5,000 TV. Now, I can understand if folks feel like this sort of quid pro quo relationship must mean that TV brands get some kind of influence over editorial content. Let me be clear, they do not and they know that too. And most of them know not to even try. The folks I deal with have been at this reviewer program thing for a long time. They know my editorial commentary is not for sale. They can't ask me to say something or not say something. I mean, they can ask, but ultimately I'm gonna say no. I say what I wanna say and that's it. That's why none of my reviews will ever be sponsored and why sponsored content is clearly labeled as such and we don't try to pass it off as a review either. I think it's fair to say that cannot be said for some other publications and it definitely cannot be said for so-called influencers who will 100% try to pass off paid content as editorial content. I'm not saying all influencers do that but it is pretty common. The teams that work with influencers are very different than the teams that work with journalists. Unfortunately for me, that means sometimes influencers get stuff before I do or even get stuff that I won't get. But I'm okay with that because those instances are few and far between to begin with. And also my editorial content just doesn't get compromised. There are also some other general feasibility issues such as if I get to buy all the products I review, then all the other editors at Digital Trend should get to do the same. And if it's not tenable for me alone, it's certainly not something that can be supported across the entire publication. There's also the hard fact that even with dedicated people handling all the logistics, it's unlikely we could keep up with the publishing schedule that we wanna maintain. Also, keep in mind that reviewing TVs is not all that I do. I review lots of other tech products. I do public speaking. I cover trade shows and other events. I guest on TV and radio programs. Like, I need TVs here when I need them here and gone when I need them gone, no delays. And frankly, it's tough enough as it is with TV brands handling the logistics. Oh, and I wanna address the question of why don't I just buy them and return them? Because I get to buy and return a TV maybe twice before I get blacklisted. And that's if someone doesn't figure out who I am and what I'm up to at the start. Amazon, b &H, Best Buy, Target, Crutchfield. I mean, I'll burn up all of those in one year. And that kind of leads into another part of this. I do stuff at a scale that only other large publications do, and sometimes even more than them. I review a lot of TVs and other products as well. I don't have the opportunity to borrow and return these TVs because I would destroy somebody's business if I did that by completely obliterating their margins. And finally, I wanna address the notion that I'm always going to receive golden samples and that my experience will be drastically different than that of the general consumer. First of all, not every TV that I get here is a golden sample, I promise you. I've received some TVs that did not have very good screen uniformity or were just riddled with DSE or the processor just didn't behave correctly or crapped out entirely. It happens and I report on it. Also, I think there's this notion that, I'll just use TCL as an example because I think their TVs are familiar and at the front of mind for a lot of folks right now. There's this idea that, let's say a golden sample Q7 might be as good as the worst retail example of a QM8, the model just above it. And folks, that's just not true. The margin of performance difference between retail samples of one model to the next is not enough to offset the performance difference between two completely different models of TV. Also, frankly, I just want consistency. I'd like to see the best example of a TV's capable performance and compare that to the best example of another TV's capable performance, thus leveling the playing field for these TVs. Granted, the level is gonna be very high, but it's level and that's what matters to me. So folks, I hope that that helps explain why we don't buy TV review samples. I mean, I realize there's a lot of inside baseball there, but you know what, the way I see it, if I'm gonna answer such a commonly asked question, I'm gonna do it all the way. The best thing I can do is just be fully transparent and give you all the information. So there you have it. I hope it was valuable to you. I hope it helps give you kind of an idea of like how we run this business and how we do this reviewer thing, uh, what happens behind the scenes for that, the difference between journalism and influencism. I, it's not a word, but I'm just gonna use it anyway. 
Thank you so much for taking this ride with me. I really appreciate it. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to this video. I'll see you on the next one. And until then, here's two other videos I think you might like.